Mark Driscoll was called off the stage at a men's conference over the weekend when he criticized the conference for hosting what kind of looked like a strip tease on stage. Also, the Golden Bachelor and his new woman have called it quits. They are getting a divorce. We've also got a Pitbull update and a few more things to discuss on today's episode of Relatable. Hey guys, welcome to Relatable. Happy Thursday. Hope everyone is having a wonderful week. All right, you guys have been asking me to talk about this Mark Driscoll situation, and I'm sorry that I have kept you waiting for as long as I have, but I've got a take on it. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, don't worry, I will break it all down for you. Those of you who kind of know what I'm talking about, you've probably just seen the names like Mark Driscoll, Stripper, Church, kicked off stage, and you're like, do I even, do I even want to know? Do I even want to know? Uh, but you do want to know. It's not as bad and also it's simultaneously worse than you might be thinking. So let me explain all of this. This is summarized from Newsweek as well as Western Journal. So Pastor Mark Driscoll, you probably know him from rising to prominence several years ago, probably between 15 and 20 years ago when he was a pastor of Mars Hill, and that was a big church out of Seattle that he was the head of. Of course, there was uh, a lot of controversy surrounding his leadership and some of the things that he taught at the time. Uh, But he is a pastor, again, not at Mars Hill, but at a different church, and he has kind of been reintroduced into the public sphere recently. I would call him definitely a conservative Christian. I would not call him reformed. He might identify more as uh, evangelical. So I'm sure that there are plenty of things that he and I agree on. I know that there is because I follow him and I see that. But then there are also theological things that we diverge on. And uh, this particular instance involving Mark Driscoll is going viral. And I think for good reason. And I kind of, I think, have a different take on it than what I've seen on the internet over the past few days. So first, let me finish my summary and then I'll get to that. So uh, he was kicked off stage at a Christian men's conference after criticizing a sword swallowing performance that appeared like something from a strip club. So that's an interesting sentence right there. The Stronger Men's Conference that was held at the Great Southern Bank Arena in Springfield, Missouri on April 12th and 13th, Um, there Mark Driscoll began his talk by criticizing an earlier performance at the conference by sword swallower Alex Magala. All right. So uh, there were over 10,000 men there. It often includes big names like Louis Giglio, Kirk Cousins, um, other people that maybe you've heard of. And then the host of the conference is John Lindell. I hadn't heard about John Lindell from some of the messages that you've sent me. You guys have heard about him. I would say the feeling from my audience just from the messages that I've received is not a positive uh, opinion of him. And after seeing kind of this whole interaction in this conference, I would probably be on the same page as you. Um, One of the most anticipated features of the event is the Friday night entertainment, which is included in the past professional bull riding, motocross, BMX competition, and professional (laughs) boxing. All right. Um, During the Friday night performance of this year's conference, Alex uh, Magala, I think that's how you pronounce his name, took off his shirt, climbed a pole on stage, and swallowed a sword. Here is Sot One. Okay, he ascends up the pole and he swallows the sword too. And Daily Mail also noted that he is he was a finalist on America's Got Talent 
And when he was not doing like sword swallowing and scaling poles, he is a stripper. Okay, so he is a stripper. That is who this Christian conference decided to hire for their Friday night entertainment. Now, Mark Driscoll, when it was his turn to give his talk at this conference, he decided that he was going to call out what he called the Jezebel spirit of this performance. Here's that too. In front of that was a man who ripped his shirt off like a woman does in front of a pole at a strip club. That man then ascended. See, our God is not arrogant. He doesn't ascend. Our God is humble. He descends. And then he swallowed a sword and Jesus cried. Okay, Pastor John, I'll receive that. Thank you. All right, so if you can't hear everything that was happening there, there is a voice, it sounds like from the crowd, saying, you're done, you're done. So that was John Lindell, the host of this conference, and that's why Pastor Mark said, okay, I received that. And then he picked up his Bible, he got off stage, and then I saw another clip that was going around that there was like a huge ruckus after that. I don't know exactly what the men in the audience were responding to, but there was a lot of yelling, there was a lot of like getting up. It looks like some people were leaving. People were angry about this. Now, maybe some people were angry at Mark Driscoll. Maybe some people were angry at John Lindell. John Lindell ended up going on stage to try to defend himself, like why he called Mark off stage. He said, um, he said, I talked to Mark for a half hour. He's on stage. He's got a microphone talking to the crowd. There was not one word of that. He is out of line. If he wants to say it, he can say it to me. You may not agree with me. You may not agree with him, but we are brothers in Christ and there's a right way to handle this. Of course, he cited Matthew 18, which basically says, look, if you've got a problem with a brother in Christ, you need to go to that brother first. And so that's what he's saying. That's why he said that Mark Driscoll was out of line. He should have come to him. Him first, he should have handled it correctly, whether you agree with the content of either of their arguments or not. So I've got my thoughts on all of this. Uh, let me go ahead and pause. Let me tell you about our first sponsor for the day before we get into it. And that is Every Life. This is another awesome pro-life company that I really want you guys to support. Surprisingly, unfortunately, even diaper companies pay politicians send their money to pro-choice organizations um, that fund the slaughter of babies that should be alive and wearing that company's diapers. It's just absolutely awful, but you don't have to worry about that with every life. This is a pro-life diaper company. They are using your money to protect life. They are ensuring that their employer or employees work in a culture that is life-giving and life-celebrating. They make sure that all of the parents at their company, adoptive or biological, are taken care of, that they are supported. You can also buy through Every Life, their Buy for a Cause bundle, and that provides resources to moms in need who have a crisis pregnancy situation, plus all of their diapers at Every Life are really high quality. You can go ahead and subscribe, get your box of, di of diapers that you need every month, and you won't be disappointed, and you can just feel really good about where your money is going. Go to everylife.com, use promo code ALLY10, enjoy a 10% discount on your first order, everylife.com, code ALLY10. Okay, so later in the conference, John Lindell and Mark Driscoll returned to the stage to discuss the conflict. Driscoll apologized and said he should have talked to Lindell first. Um, it's kind of difficult to hear the audio that we saw, so we're kind of like summarizing what was happening. Lindell heaps praises on Driscoll. He said, you want to know what John the Baptist was like? Mark is a prophetic voice of our generation. Driscoll apologizes for calling out the way he did and should have gotten permission from the spiritual father, his words, of the event. Mark describes what he was thinking as he got on stage. When I was teaching, I just kept seeing it. Maybe it was the Lord. Maybe it's just me and I'm peculiar. At this point, someone from the crowd yelled, Mark, you're right. Mark, Mark interjects saying, no, 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 we're not going to have the vision. What we're going to do is model how brothers in the Lord do reconciliation. So I know that there are a lot of disagreements and a lot of complaints that people have about Mark Driscoll. We're not going to get into all of those right now. I just 
want to focus on what happened here and kind of what people are saying and then what my perspective is. So some people are saying that this was all scripted. This was just a way for Mark Driscoll to grift and to get attention and to make it seem like he has this like sincere godly posture and that he saw this as an opportunity to go viral on social media. Some people are saying that it's staged between the two to try to go viral on social media. I saw some takes saying that there's no way that Mark Driscoll wouldn't have already known going into the conference that this guy was going to be ascending um, uh, ascending a pole and swallowing a sword and all of that. And so he must have approved of that. And then he saw it as an opportunity to, you know, present himself as the prophetic voice speaking against evil in his own camp. Here's what I think happened, and I don't have any inside information, but I've spoken at a lot of conferences, a lot of events, and a lot of churches. As as someone who also speaks a lot, I can almost guarantee that Mark Driscoll did not know that there was going to be that kind of entertainment on the Friday night. There would have really been no reason for him to know that. He probably has either a speaking agent or uh, an assistant or a team of people who handles his speaking engagements. He knows John Lindell. He knows this conference. He knows who's spoken there in the past. He probably knew who was speaking, and he probably did approve of all of those things, or he entrusted his team with the responsibility to check all those things out. There would have really been— and maybe I'm wrong on this, but again, just speaking from my own personal experience, there would have really been no reason for John Lindell or any other person at the conference to run by the Friday night entertainment uh, or run by Mark Driscoll, the Friday night entertainment. I don't see why he would have known that. Personally, I think that he was genuine in the moment calling out something that he saw as wicked, which I agree with that, by the way. There was no reason to get a stripper. It is apparently very publicly known that he was a local stripper. There was no reason to get a stripper to come on stage to take off part of his clothes and to ascend a pole. Like, I, there's just no reason for that. There's all kinds of entertainment that you could do and then swallow a sword. It's just very weird and has sexual undertones. And there's no place for that at a church conference. I mean, we can kind of have our disagreements about whether a church conference should even have like Friday night entertainment anyway. I think that's a secondary issue. I think as long as the entertainment is glorifying to God and is relevant, okay, but this wasn't. It's not glorifying to God to basically do some kind of strange form of a strip tease at a Christian conference. And so I agree with what Mark Driscoll said that was wrong. Now, I do take issue and maybe in context, if he and I were talking about this, I wouldn't disagree. But he said, like, our God didn't ascend. He descended. Well, that's true. He did descend. He did humble himself. But of course, he then ascended and he led a host of captives as we read for example in Ephesians 4 8 um and so that part like I kind of take issue with but he was in the moment trying to explain that this is not a representation of the humility that Jesus showed and that we are also supposed to humiliate and also like I said there's like this weird sexual stripper like aspect to it so I agree with him and I happen to think like this is the more charitable reading and I don't know Mark Driscoll at all but it just seemed to me that in the moment, he really was deciding whether or not he was going to say this. So while it may be true that he should have talked to the conference host first, I think that probably would have been the better way to go. I don't think that it was intentional. I don't think that he got up there and thought, I'm going to create this viral moment and I'm going to pull one over on John Lindell um, I, I, it doesn't come across like that. It doesn't. It, it comes across as, should I say this? Should I not say this? Should I correct this? And I think it just, in his mind in that moment, it was just too much for him not to address, or he felt like it would be hypocritical for him to talk about, you know, a Jezebel spirit 
and sexual immorality and the kind of degeneracy that has taken over our culture and has even deceived many men and women in the church without calling out the fact that a portion of that was at the very conference where he is speaking. I think he was trying to be consistent and to be honest in this moment. Um, Now, again, I don't know the background. That's how it came across to me. And whatever disagreements I have with both of them and this conference, I do think them coming back up there and having some form of reconciliation and showing people how to do it was good. But I kind of I, I wish the host would have had the humility to say, you know what, not only do I admire him in general, I admire him in this specific moment because he was right. We messed up. We shouldn't have had that Friday night entertainment. We have no business hiring a stripper. Maybe he didn't know he was a stripper. I don't know. He stripped like he knew what he was doing on the stage of this Christian conference. So he probably should have known that. He so he should have gotten up like during the Friday night entertainment and been like, that's enough. So see, here's what I'll say. So it wasn't that John Lindell was willing to stop Mark Driscoll from telling the truth about the pseudo striptease, but he was not willing to stop the pseudo striptease. So Mark Driscoll had to get off the stage for speaking that truth, but the stripper didn't have to get off the stage for stripping. So it's just a little weird, I think, like what the what the standard is. You're willing to kind of, I don't know, uh, equivocate, it seems like, on a display of sexual immorality, but when it comes to being criticized or called out, in what he considered to be an imperfect way, um, that's too much. That's too far. I think our priorities are out of order. And I think when we demand, this is a bigger issue, when we demand to be entertained by all of the flashing lights and all of the um, glittery splendor and the overstimulation that we are used to when we're watching a movie or scrolling on our phones. We demand all of that in church. That is when I think that we are going to start to see compromise because you got to get bigger and better every Sunday, every year. That's what we see at Elevation Church. That's what we see at Mike Todd's church. It's what we see at a lot of like prosperity centric churches is that expositing the word And simple verse by verse exegetical preaching isn't, they think it's not enough for people. It's not exciting for people. If you've ever gone to John MacArthur's church, I personally haven't before. Of course, he preaches exegetically verse by verse, but I have friends who attend that church. I have friends who have visited that church recently. It is bursting at the seams. It is also one of the most ethnically and economically diverse churches, I would say, in the country, and they don't pander at all. All he does is every Sunday preach verse by verse, and it is overflowing with Christians who just want truth. They just want scripture. They don't want every sermon to be about them, to be about their feelings, to sit around them. They're not looking to be stars of the show. And some preachers— um, like the ones I listed, you know, like Furtick and the like, uh, they think that their audience has to be entertained. And then maybe one day they will be entertained into entertaining the gospel. And that's just not how it works. What is that phrase? Whatever you uh, win people with, you win them to. And so I know the argument is, well, if we make things flashy and exciting, at least people will come into church. But they are coming into church to see the flashy and exciting, not to hear the gospel. And so they want the flashy and exciting. They don't necessarily desire Christ. So we win people to church with the aroma of Christ. That doesn't mean that we can't have wonderful artistic performances. That can't mean that we can't allow people within the church who have those giftings to use them in Sunday service for the glory of God. I think the music should be high quality. I think the instruments should be incredible. I think the graphic design and uh, whatever technology is used should be used in an excellent way to the absolute best of our ability, but it should all be pointing to the gospel. It should all be pointing to Christ, not trying to overshadow the gospel in the hopes that someone will be able to like pull back the curtain one day 
and see, you know, the truth of Jesus. That's just not how it works. And so that's just a problem in general. And I also want to say, this is something that I meant to say when we talked about Stephen Furtick on Monday or whenever it was, uh, Tuesday, um, that I do think that pastors, as I said, should be understated in their appearance when they're on stage. I also think that goes for like all the pyrotechnics and like all of that. I do believe it should be understated. I'm not a legalist on that. I'm not saying that you can have like a little bit of fog machine, but not too much. I'm I'm not saying that there are hard and fast rules about that. But I do think things should be beautiful yet understated. And that includes how the pastor dresses himself. I think it should be respectful, but I think it should communicate humility and dignity, not look at me. And I think that also the mentality should be, I want to do everything in my power to not tempt anyone in my congregation to covetousness or to envy or to greed. Now, everyone's sins are their own responsibility through the power of the Spirit to fight. But in the same way that we are to dress modestly, just to do everything that we can within our power, not to provoke someone to lust, even though that lust is ultimately their responsibility. So I think we also dress ourselves with the desire to display humility rather than the desire to have someone be jealous of us, of what we can afford and what we can wear. And it is an irresponsible act, I think, as a pastor. I'm thinking of the ones that we've talked about, like with preachers and sneakers, to wear these kinds of flashy clothes so that people will look at them and say, I want that. You are not shepherding them. You are leading them as sheep to the slaughter. You are not protecting them from the wolves of greed and covetousness. And that is a really scary prospect when you consider, as the book of James tells us, that teachers are going to be judged more harshly than everyone else. So I just think that's something to consider whenever we are looking at all of this flashy entertainment. It's not enough to just say, well, it might meet some people where they are and be seeker sensitive. There's a way we can be excellent and beautiful and entertaining and still point to Christ rather than draw people away from him, like through a freaking strip tease at a men's conference. Craziness. All right. That's my take on that. There's a lot more probably that we could say about it, but that's that's all I got. Um, again, I know there's a larger conversation to have about that people, you know, want to hear about Mark Driscoll and Mars Hill and all of that and, you know— Maybe we can talk about that one day, but um, that's my take on that specific situation. All right, before we get into the next story, let me tell you about our next sponsor for the day, and that is Focus on the Family and their new podcast, which is Practice Makes Parent. Focus on the Family has just launched this new podcast that is all about parenting, all about marriage. It's hosted by Rebecca St. James, the Australian-American Christian pop singer, actress, mom. Also, she's teaming up with Dr. Danny Huerta, who is the VP of Parenting and Youth at Focus on the Family, to bring you real practical and biblical advice. Each episode covers the stuff that really matters, communication, intimacy, managing money, handling daily stress, all of it. Tune in to Practice Makes Parent every Wednesday on Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcast. It will be so encouraging and equipping for you. Practice Makes Parent. Okay, y'all, I'm super sad. The Golden Bachelor and his woman have already called it quits. They're already getting a divorce. What in the world? At this point, okay, Golden Bachelor, you just need to write it out. Okay, like what is the point of getting a divorce? Like are you going to you're are you going to go through the process and get like you went through all of this, you broke all of those women's hearts and you chose this woman, Teresa, which from the beginning my friend and I were like, not that lady. And you chose her. You should have listened to us. And you might, you might not be in this situation. I don't remember the lady's name that you should have chosen, but I also knew from the beginning. I think she's the one that, like, played the guitar or something. I honestly only watched, like, the first three or so episodes because the friend that I was watching it with, she ended up having um, her baby rude, and then we didn't, we couldn't, well, I didn't want to watch it by myself. So, um, 
I stopped after like the third episode, but I knew from the beginning it shouldn't have been Teresa. Uh, here they are, Jerry and Teresa announcing their divorce. And we've kind of come to the conclusion mutually mm -hmm. that it's probably time for us to um, dissolve our marriage. Get a divorce. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Three months after getting married. Yes. Yes. I think we just feel like it's best for the happiness of each of us to, to live apart. Um, what a weird way to say that. I like how the journalist had to be like, get a divorce, dissolve your marriage. What in the world are you talking about? Get a divorce. You think it's better for the happiness of both of you. So what they found out after they got married on television in January, after a whirlwind romance through the Golden Bachelors, that they don't like each other. That's it. I mean, if you find out after a couple months, we made a mistake, you don't like each other. You don't love each other. You weren't willing to put the work in. And she says that she hopes it doesn't, um, the hope that it's given people, that that doesn't change. Of course it's going to change because it, it, you are showing people this romance that everyone thought was real, that everyone thought was sincere and so wonderful that people who the world may have counted out as past their prime can date and fall in love and be attracted to one another. And it wasn't real. If you are getting a divorce this early on, I don't think that any of it was real. Maybe you had some feelings for each other, but you didn't have that kind of real, solid, sacrificial, commitment-level love if the marriage is already, quote-unquote, dissolving, or they are just very superficial people and nothing went actually wrong after marriage and they just didn't, you know, they were just used to living by themselves and they realized, okay, we don't really want to do this. It also, I feel like when marriages end this quickly, it's like one person ended up being way different than the other person thought. And my assessment is, you know, I don't know. I don't know which I, I don't know which person it was. I will say that Jerry had a very different background than what was portrayed. It was portrayed that he was like a restaurateur, that he was a rich, successful entrepreneur, and he just really wanted someone to share his wealth and share his life with. That wasn't true at all. That was not true about him. He was not a restaurateur. He was not a wealthy or successful entrepreneur. He owned like a fast food franchise in 1985. And they just found him because they felt like we could give him a makeover, make him look like and present him as some like wealthy, got it together guy when really he might not be. Maybe he is a sweetheart. And I don't know, this just didn't work out, which is a terrible way to think about marriage. Um, or maybe they ended up being completely different people. Teresa posted, don't cry because it's over, smile because it happened. Dr. Seuss. What? That is so dumb. You're talking about marriage and you are like grandparents here. Come on. This is like teenage level juvenility. This is not how we think about matrimony. This is not what we think about a covenant of marriage. It does reflect, though, the popular notion about marriage. I saw another couple that I followed one of them on Instagram saying, you know, we've just decided to end our marriage. Basically, irreconcilable differences. And while you never know what's really going on, of course, if there's like abuse happening there, that's one thing. But irreconcilable differences, not being happy, not having the same feelings, having a difficult time working out the disagreements that you have, trying to get used to living together. None of these reasons come anywhere close to a justification for divorce. And, you know, I was just thinking the other day about how growing up, and of course, when our parents were growing up, there was such a stigma around divorce, whether you were Christian or not. And there can be goods and bads of stigma, but we've moved into this age when all stigma is demonized. We're trying to remove stigma from everything. Well, some things need to be stigmatized. We've actually inherited um, stigma, I think, from our ancestors, not like in an evolutionary way, but we've just been 
taught that over time um, that there should be stigma around certain things because when something becomes prevalent, it's bad for you and it's bad for society. It doesn't lead to strong societies. It leads to weak societies. And that is true about divorce. Of course, there are some biblical exceptions, some biblical reasons for divorce. They are very, very rare. And God still hates divorce because what God brought together, let no man separate the husband and wife become one flesh. Again, I'm not talking about abuse, but in the vast majority of situations, marriage is something that is supposed to be uh, held on to, held together for life. And this flippant Dr. Seuss quote, to react to a divorce is such the perfect description of how America has destigmatized divorce, example of how we've destigmatized divorce, how we've normalized it, how we even celebrate it, because we will lay absolutely anything down on the altar of our happiness. We will lay our friendships down. We will lay our membership uh, in church down. We will lay our marriages down. We will lay our kids down. We will get an abortion. We will leave the church that told us that something that was sin. We will leave the marriage that was a little bit hard. We will reject the friendships that were no longer convenient and comfortable for us. We will stop doing all of the things that require discipline and self-control and self-assessment. And instead, we will pursue only that which is convenient and comfortable and serves us and our feelings in the moment. And we are, we are absolutely filled to the brim with our own happiness and we are still miserable. Isn't that interesting that we choose the easy way out and it makes us happy in the moment and then we end up lonely, miserable, and suffering. And this is the whole lie of like this self-love. Um, happiness is the utmost goal trend that has completely taken over our culture over the past several decades that we are constantly told that if you just pursue what you want in any given moment, finally you will be liberated from all that ails you. Everything will start making sense. Everything will start falling into place. You will finally succeed and be fulfilled. And it's just a lie. Because what have we always said since I wrote my, wrote my book about this in 2019? Um, the self can't be both the problem and the solution. So if inside yourself you are finding depression, misery, anxiety, dissatisfaction, discontentment, you are not going to find the solution to those things in the same place that you are finding all of your problems. You are not the solution to, you are not the answer to everything that you are looking for. All of that is found outside of ourselves, namely in our creator who alone can tell us who we are and what we are worth, who alone is the source of happiness and fulfillment for which we long and that we are trying and failing to find uh, everywhere except for where it actually exists in Jesus. And so when that happens, when we all worship the God of self, we end up normalizing and celebrating things like divorce adultery, um, even surrogacy, reproductive technology, abortion, anything that serves our wants. And it doesn't matter what we sacrifice in the way. And so, I mean, this is sad for a lot of reasons. It's ridiculous and, and darkly funny. I mean, I don't know if I want to say funny, but like, oh my gosh, I can't believe the Golden Bachelor has already gotten a divorce. But it also is just like a sad commentary on how we view marriage and the family and relationships um, in the United States and probably not um, the most surprising. Also, like when you look at the fact that uh, there was a lot of money involved in this, you kind of see that there were probably some superficial motivations behind getting engaged and getting married. And then when it no longer served them financially, they got a divorce. This is according to Slate. Um, as the series lead... He may have been, uh, Jerry, it says, may have been paid north of $100,000 for the season, which I actually would have thought that it was um, 
more than that. Uh, Teresa, as the winner, made off with a princess cut diamond engagement ring worth at worth an estimated forty thousand um, dollars. The first ever televised bachelor union way back in two thousand three was a three point seven seven million dollar wedding. That is unbelievable between Trista and Ryan, and they were also paid a million dollars to get married on camera. Wow, that is incredible. I think Trista and Ryan are actually still still together. Um, and so we just don't know how much they were paid. They could have gone through with the wedding because they were paid for it. And then they got a divorce because it wasn't, it wasn't helpful anymore. All right, so that's kind of sad. That's the Golden Bachelor. Uh, all right, a couple more things to talk about. Uh, let me tell you about our next sponsor, and that is America's Christian Credit Union. So we've heard about this awful trend of debanking where banks actually refuse to work with people because of their political views. We don't want to have to worry about that, especially if it's going to get worse. So you might want to make the switch to America's Christian Credit Union. America's Christian Credit Union is the number one banking institution on Public Square. It's provided a full suite of financial services to God-fearing Americans just like you for more than 65 years. Families, ministries, businesses across the country have ditched the big banks and chosen ACCU as their trusted financial partner instead. When you switch to America's Christian Credit Union, you'll get great rates, cutting-edge mobile banking, and the convenience of more than 35,000 branches and ATMs nationwide. Why would you keep doing business with financial institutions whose interests don't align with yours? Go ahead, make the switch. You can go to americaschristiancu.com slash switch. America's Christian Credit Union is federally insured by the National Credit Union Administration. Okay, Bree, should we talk about Ben Affleck and Jennifer Garner and their child? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or should we, we talk should... about pit bulls? Oh. Because we might only have time for one more. Which one? Which one? Which one? Or we can talk about both quickly. I think we should hit both quickly. Okay. Um, Jennifer Garner and Ben Affleck... They're one of many celebrities that have a child now, a daughter, 15 years old, Serafina Rose, uh, who has come out as quote unquote trans. So this uh, she, we were going to use she, but there are some outlets that will use he, um, came out, like introduced herself by her new name, Finn, when she spoke at her grandfather's memorial service in early April. This was recorded. Um, and so the video has been making the rounds. She says, hello, my name is Finn Affleck. Then read chapter 16, verse 8 from the book of Proverbs. Better is a little with righteousness than a large income with injustice. Okay. Um, so you probably know Jennifer Garner and Affleck. Um, they have uh, three kids together, and they split in 2015. They finalized their divorce in 2018. In 2022, Affleck married singer Jennifer Lopez. They dated like 20 years ago, whose 16-year-old daughter also uses gender-neutral pronouns and has become close to Finn as a step-sibling. And this girl calls herself uh, non-binary. J-Lo first publicly introduced her daughter's pronouns to a crowd at the L.A. Dodgers Foundation's Blue Diamond Gala, where they both performed in June 2022. It's just awful, and it's so obvious that this is a social contagion. Do you have anything else to say about that, Brie? Any oh, thoughts? No, I think it's just like <coughs> so convenient that both Jennifer Lopez's daughter and Ben Affleck's daughter have the same identity. Same identity. It's totally organic. Yeah. They were just born that way. It was by chance that they found each other. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. And it's also just a coincidence that all of these celebrities, all these other celebrities, have children who are very confused and deceived about their gender. We've got Jamie Lee Curtis. This is Jamie Lee Curtis and her daughter, Ruby. I dare you to look at this person and say she, her. Um... <laughs> who as an adult decided that he was um, a woman and Jamie Lee Curtis has been very defensive of him as a, uh, as a woman. And then we've got Charlize Theron, who I think is one of the most, was maybe one of the first 
celebrities that I saw um, dressing up her adopted sons that she adopted from Africa in girls' clothing. Like, how is this not a bigger deal? How was this not a bigger deal when this was first happening? Like, is there not some, like, I don't know, someone out there who is like a racial activist who can at least say that it's crazy to adopt boys from Africa and then turn them into girls, try to turn them into girls? How can anyone say that that's not evil? Theron announced this, uh, announced publicly that uh, her son, Jackson, is actually a girl at seven years old, claiming he had told her three years prior that he was really a girl. So when he was four years old, okay, four-year-olds can be really smart. They can also not know anything. Like as a mother of a four-year-old, a brilliant four-year-old, I know that they're like, let me tell you this cute story. It's adorable. My mom has this plant in her backyard. And my mom was telling my four-year-old, this is a mosquito plant. And that, of course, it keeps mosquitoes away. Well, my four-year-old the next day was explaining the plants to my two-year-old and was going around and explaining all the different plants and what they do. And she pointed to the mosquito plant and said, and this one's going to turn into a mosquito. That's adorable. That is adorable. But she did not understand that that is not what my mom meant when she was saying this was a mosquito plant. So at the same time, kids are like brilliant and awesome and learning so much. And they also don't understand so many things. And so when Charlize Theron's son said, I'm a girl. He probably was just saying something that he saw at preschool. He probably was saying something that he saw in a movie, in a book, if he even said it, by the way. That is the more charitable reading. The less charitable reading is that she is a sick freak with Munchausen by proxy who just wants the attention and the satisfaction of kind of like being oppressed and having a kid who identifies as the opposite sex. I mean, I can't think of anything. There are few things more evil than this. I mean, abortion, yes, because you're murdering them. But then, okay, if they actually survive the womb, you're going to try to transition them into the opposite sex, which, of course, is living a lie and leading them down um, a path of butchery for their body. I mean, it is just awful. And then we do have Brad Pitt and Angelina. They have a daughter named Shiloh. And then um, who kind of was like uh, looking gender fluid at one point, but who has since um, publicly dressed a lot more uh, feminine, which is interesting. And then, yeah, we've got several others. You've got several other celebrities who ch- whose children just um, very spontaneously and completely organically have decided to identify as the opposite sex. And of course, I don't think it is spontaneous. I think that it is when you have parents who are either pushing this on you or who don't supervise um, what content you are consuming and who think that a child is in charge and who think that a young child has some kind of like special knowing about who they are on the inside and they don't have a good moral worldview, that the body actually matters and indicates who we are. And it can't be changed by declaration or identity when you have a parent who is just like completely morally lost. And then they these children are victims of the culture, which says you can change your gender. That's how this is going to happen. And it's really sad. It's really sad. I feel I feel for these children. Maybe they will be turned back into the right direction. We should certainly pray for that. But just another example, you should never, ever, ever look to celebrities as your moral exemplars for any reason at all. They're very lost, very confused, very broken. And that's not just recent. Like, that's been like that for hundreds of years. Like, if you look at old Hollywood and you read about some of their lives and how broken and sad and really, like, morally destitute they were, I mean, there's something just very, very dark about Hollywood, probably even beyond what we really know. 
All right, Bri, I don't know if you have anything else to say about that. Is there any interesting factoid that I missed on this? There's no interesting factoids to add, but I will just say you already touched on it, but specifically with Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez and um, Jennifer Garner, it just it makes me sad because you can see the pattern of like like we know what Ben Affleck did to Jennifer Garner, for example. Maybe there's more to the story, but he cheated on her with a nanny and those kids knew that and they see that and and these are just the repercussions of broken families and that just just makes me really sad on top of all the hollywood stuff that probably is just piling on top of it so no that's a really good point that's a really good point is that that can cause destabilization trauma drama that would make a kid try to like figure out who they are um and when you don't really have any guidance on that i also think that parents who have broken up their marriages they suffer from some guilt Mm -hmm. and their thought is and desire is i just want to do whatever makes them happy i don't want to fight with them i don't want to make things worse for them and if their child comes to them as like this is what will make me happy it's really tough for them to push back yeah and i love i mean i like jennifer garner at least from what i see she's so charming yeah and like seems like a total sweetheart um and i'm sure she i'm not saying like she is a bad mom but, uh, yeah, it just makes me sad. Mm-hmm. Makes me sad for the kids who are so clearly lost. Me too. Yeah. Okay. Um, let us talk about pit bulls. <laughs> we'll end on that. <laughs> we'll end the week on that, and then people can be upset. Um, okay. Last sponsor, though. If you're a business owner, you need to know about NetSuite by Oracle. This is the number one cl- cloud financial system. It brings all that you need, accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, into one platform, one source of truth. It's going to help you cut costs. It's going to help you be so much more efficient and effective with your business. Over 37,000 companies have already made this move. You'll see how you profit with NetSuite when you make the switch. NetSuite has uh, extended its one-of-a-kind flexible financing program for a few more weeks. So go ahead, head to netsuite.com slash Allie, that's N-E-T-S-U-I-T-E dot com slash Allie. Check them out. NetSuite.com slash Allie. All right. So there are just several more stories of pit bulls um, mauling people and attacking other dogs, ruining lives, as many pit bulls do. And so I'm going to go through that, and then I'm going to remind you of why it is the breed, okay? So get to the end of this segment for me. Okay, first story is out of Portsmouth, Virginia, and there was a woman who died, this is just last week, awful, after being mauled by three pit bulls at a house where she was visiting. Apparently, these pit bulls had caused several incidents, chasing kids down the street, Um, animal control had been called, authorities had been called, nothing had been done because it's very difficult to do anything in these situations. And there are several reasons for that. Um, One, if you live in a more liberal area, many times it's just um, they believe that they are being compassionate by not taking away dogs from their owners. Also, like this is kind of an awkward thing to say, but You'll see many times it comes down to like this weird social racial justice issue because a disproportionate number of pit bulls are apparently owned statistically by black and brown Americans. And so they will claim like that taking away the dogs or targeting these dogs is also like an attack on particularly quote unquote marginalized groups. And so it becomes this weird like social justice left right issue, which it absolutely shouldn't. But politics always comes into play in these issues. It could just also be incompetence. Um, There was also, like you'll remember, remember the um, woman that I had on, I think it was about a year ago, whose pit bulls um, attacked and killed her cows. 
remember that and how awful that was uh, in the state of Arkansas. And then the local prosecutor was so corrupt and it ended up being like this weird accusation of like racism thing going on because one of the owners of the pit bulls who had gotten out and mauled the cow um, was black and then the prosecutor is black. And so it like ended up being this like weird race thing. And it was so hard for her to get any kind of justice or accountability for her uh, for her animals because of that. And so who knows, that could have been what happened in this story, but authorities didn't do what they needed to do. There was also a pit bull breeder mauled to death by his own dogs in Compton. He was feeding the dogs. This was a couple of weeks ago. And, um, he was he went into their pen to feed them and then he was taken to the ground and mauled to death which is absolutely terrifying i also saw just a story just the other day award-winning children's uh, author rosanna murray 73 had her arm and ear ripped off after being mauled by three pit bulls in brazil just the other day also, just the other day, Florida pit bulls tore apart a vehicle. This is, I saw a video on Twitter about this. Uh, tear apart a vehicle in pursuit of a cat that was like hiding in the undercarriage of the car. And these pit bulls tore this car to, car to shreds to try to get this cat. And then I saw also just the other day um, a, a pit bull at a dog show attacked a Siberian husky would not let go. Now, here's the thing about this, because I always hear it's the owner. It's the owner. It's not the breed. It's the owner. I guarantee, especially this pit bull at the dog show was well taken care of and well loved and well fed his entire life. That's certainly true. Remember a couple years ago when the pit bulls in um, a family home in Nashville mauled two children to death? and mauled the mother to the point to where she was in the hospital. I mean, this was a normal family who had these puppies, had these dogs from puppyhood. They were defenders and advocates of pit bulls. These dogs, they said, were a part of their family, loved very well, snapped and mauled them to death. It is the breed. It's crazy how People get so irrational about this and believe that pit bulls are the only breed that start with a blank slate. No other breed starts with a uh, a blank slate. Like shepherds, herd. That is what they are bred to do. Retrievers, retrieve. That is what they are bred to do. Labs, love water. That's what they were bred to do. There are all different kinds of dogs terriers, beagles, hounds that are bred to do certain things. They are inclined to do that thing. Not all of them do. Some are better than others, but they are made to do and have been bred to do over years and years of breeding to do what they are inclined to do. It is innate. Pit bulls were bred to bait bulls. They were bred to bait hogs. They were bred to hunt hogs and to be able to latch on to a bull and not let go. No, they were not nanny dogs. They were not the dogs that took care of the babies. That is a giant myth. They have been bred for years and years and years to fight. They have been bred to hang on to really strong and really heavy animals to latch on to their jugular and to not let go. Don't tell me your story about how your chihuahua bit you and it really hurt. Don't tell me your story about the one golden retriever that became rabid one day and like nipped at your child. I understand all dogs can bite. All dogs can be dangerous. That is 100% true. I do think that pit bulls have a disproportionate number of irresponsible owners because they can be bred to fight, but it is the breed. I know your pit bull is so sweet and so kind and you allow him to feed oatmeal to your newborn every morning. I know, I know. Your pit, born is re- your pit bull is really nice, but their breed is bad. Their breed is aggressive. And not only are they aggressive, but they bite to kill. That's the difference between the pit bull and the chihuahua. The chihuahua can't maul you to death. The golden retriever is probably not going to maul you to death. The pit bull, if they bite you, they're not just biting you. They are biting and they will not let go. 
Remember that skateboarder who had her mouth ripped off by the sweet pit bull a couple of years ago? That was her cousin's pit bull that she knew was really close to. Again, had been raised from puppyhood and was so kind. Latched onto her mouth randomly in the kitchen. Didn't let go. Ripped her mouth off. That's what pit bulls do. Again, I know there are sweet ones, but don't let your kids around a pit bull. Don't buy a pit bull. We should not be breeding pit bulls. It should be illegal to breed pit bulls. There has been enough loss of life for us to say, nope, no more. I'm not saying we should euthanize all pit bulls. I'm saying they should not be bred anymore. It should be illegal for the protection of human beings who matter more than animals, right? Hopefully we can get on board with that. All right, let's get out of here. Um, oh, one more thing I want to tell you about. If you need something else to kind of like rile you up and make you angry, but also help you just connect the dots and help so many things make sense for you, you've got to watch this new documentary on Blaze TV. It's called Bought and Paid For, and it explains exactly how politicians go into public service, not rich at all, and then leaving, having a net worth of like millions and billions of dollars. What are they doing? How are they doing that? What is this corrupt process that our taxpayer dollars are funding? This documentary explains all of it in a really compelling and interesting way. If you go to AllieOriginals.com, you can use code AllieOriginals. You'll get $30 off. You'll have access to this documentary as well as all of the Blaze Originals. You won't regret it. It's totally, totally worth it. Use Alley Originals for $30 off. Okay, guys, that's all we have time for today and this week. We will be back here on Monday. See you guys then. Mm-hmm.